Well, thanks uh, for such a fascinating, very interesting talk. So I had the uh, opportunity last week to be at a healthcare conference where they're talking about uh, implementation of value-based healthcare around the world and how they can curtail the rising cost of healthcare. And a lot of the things that you've talked about, they're common on that. And uh, one of the things that was interesting is you, Dr. Khan, mentioned the uh, the use of antibiotics might be a cultural thing. And it's interesting because the Scandinavian countries, they are much more advanced in implementing value health care than the U.S. And apparently that is because they have a more uh, collaborative culture within the country. So I wonder if the less or, you know, because they use less antibiotics in those countries too, do you think there's anything culturally that we can learn from those countries? and maybe implement in the U.S. to be even more collaborative? Uh, I think whatever the Scandinavians are doing, uh, they, um, they're also number one in happiness quotients as well. So um, they like to call themselves the visionary Vikings, and um, I think we have much to learn for them, from them, um, whether or not what they do can translate to other countries remains to be seen, but clearly they have the lowest use of antibiotics and the lowest levels of resistance. So whatever they're doing, and they also have um, universal access to health care. So um, I think there's much that we can learn from them and try to adopt into our country and to the other countries that are large users. I mean, I didn't get a chance to talk about the global aspects, but you have countries like India that um, use antibiotics as a substitute for sanitation and hygiene. They've got about, of the one billion people on the planet who openly defecate, 60% of them are in India, and it's no surprise that they have some of the most resistant microbes in the world. So um, they have a long ways to go. So absolutely, yes, it would be wonderful if everybody could be like the Scandinavian countries, but. Um, what exactly is it about their culture that allows them to be that way, um, I think is worthy of investigation. I can't comment specifically on, you know, elements of that, but um, certainly there are important factors that I think the world could learn from them. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentations. I just maybe wanted to highlight um, that it, you know, kind of as was alluded to yesterday, it's a little bit difficult to compare countries to one another because we have different climates, different disease pressures. Um, and I think, you know, we can see kind of the difficulties with just looking at markers such as antimicrobial use. Um, maybe we need to include in there animal health parameters, uh, what, what are the disease prevalences in the populations, um, and then also what antimicrobial resistance trends are, um, because I don't think we will defi definitively see the same trends occurring as our efforts change to improve practices and things, we may not see a huge decline in antimicrobial resistance as all would hope. So I think that making sure we have a really broad picture of what we, you know, I think it's, we don't know how to measure the success of these programs, but taking as much information as we can to show that we're making strides in the right direction is important, and sorry, that was a comment, not a question, but if you have follow-up comments for that, that would be great. Um, yeah, I think I understand your question. Um, forgive me if I don't. Um, I didn't get to show a slide. I, I cut out quite a bit for my presentation to make um, time for um, two presentations and the Q&A. One of the slides that I didn't get to show was that um, medicine is um, the prescription of antibiotics differs tremendously not only in the different countries in the European Union, but in the states in the United States. And I have a map showing huge disparities among the states. Um, and 
very high antibiotic use in the poor Appalachian region. Now, whether or not that's due to poverty, I don't know. But um, the Appalachian states are amongst the highest in the country. So certainly we must look within at what we are doing. There is no overarching, we don't have the kind of data that the Europeans do. So in terms of looking at resistance rates between states, that's just simply not available. It would be extremely helpful to get that kind of data, but it's not available. So then you could look at who's doing the best practices and learning from each other. You know, without the data, it's hard, it's hard to make, quite frankly, any headway. And what I would like to see is having NARMS and NOMS more integrated, human, animal, and in the environment, using whole genome sequencing to really understand. And also, I must say that antibiotic use data is highly proprietary. It's very expensive. So it's not freely available for researchers or for, uh, you know, hospital uh, infection control workers to be able to compare what they're doing compared to their peers. It's just not available. It's very expensive. Um, so without, without data, it's hard to really make any meaningful uh, changes in policies to, to address this kind of issue. Yes, um, I'm Peter Davies, University of Minnesota. Thanks uh, both for great presentations. My questions for Dr. Khan. Uh, first of all, thanks very much for going into the detail that you did on the vancomycin resistant enterococci, because just about every paper you see on this issue that's a reviewing uses that example and talks about it as the reason why, why these things had to happen. Uh, and your presentation gives the rest of the story. Um, my question really relates to the other part of, of phenomenon and that what I think that uh, uh, we saw was the use of the growth promotant did result in the increase in people carrying a lot of vancomycin resistant enterococci, but it not translating into the clinical infection problem, which happened through a different route and a different source. Uh, in this argument, uh, we have a lot of people um, arguing from a very generic basis that, you know, we're going to create all sorts of nasty things that are come and get us in the, uh, through use in animals. Um, how important do you think that is in terms of other examples like Callistin with the CREs, those things that, you know, VRE shows we can select for organisms in the animal sector, they can be transmitted to healthy humans probably via the food chain. Uh, but in that example, it didn't go the distance, but we're still facing the other ones, and, and is it still an important example for us in terms of uh, addressing the argument? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's important to point out that the findings for VRE are to VRE alone and not necessarily to the other microorganisms, as my medical colleagues like to point out. So they still don't want to give up the food animal etiology hypothesis. So, um, well, that's why I think the need for whole genome sequencing in this effort is so critical, because until you have that full data, you can make all sorts of assumptions based on just resistance genes. Um, you know, yeah, the food animals can have these resistance genes, humans can have the resistance genes, but it doesn't mean that they overlap. And for that, you absolutely need whole genome sequencing. And fortunately, it's becoming inexpensive enough that you can implement a surveillance system using a One Health approach to be able to track what's going on on the farms, in the general community, and in the hospital. Uh, and until we get that, we're just going to still be largely in the dark about, about the etiology and spread of these resistant organisms. Miles Thur, I'm a feedlot veterinarian. And my question was looking at the differences in some of those resistance and antibiotic uses um, across the country. I was wondering maybe in the advisory council or um, could elaborate, because we, we've talked a lot about the data and the needs of, of trying to, to put some of that information together. And has there been any steps in trying to quantify some of the management practices with those to, to build that data set for, for further evaluation so we can identify 
what, what are those management strategies that are common amongst those if it's worth to tease out? And I was wondering maybe um, if you could elaborate on any steps that's being, being done in that direction. I'm going to defer to my colleague here, Dr. Hermson. <coughs> Excuse me. So to restate your question, and please let me know if I'm getting it correctly, you're wondering if there are any steps that are being taken to share best practices and identify what those best practices are that can lead to success. So on the, I, I can speak for the human health side, there are certainly steps that are being taken to move in that direction. However, the challenge is the metrics that are used. I think we're really still early on in terms of the outcomes that we're using to measure success. Right now, the most common metrics that are used for antimicrobial stewardship on the human health side is just antimicrobial utilization measures, so things like defined daily doses or days of therapy, which do not take into account the appropriateness of that use or the inappropriateness of the use, and uh, drug acquisition cost. And neither one of those things are really tied to the ultimate goals of antimicrobial stewardship in terms of improving patient outcomes and population health. Antimicrobial utilization, you certainly can argue that if you decrease antimicrobial utilization, you have the potential to decrease antimicrobial resistance because of that picture that I showed earlier linking the two. But again, what you're trying to decrease is inappropriate antibiotic use. We're never going to get to antibiotic use of zero, and we don't want to get to antibiotic use of zero. So the challenge in sharing best practices is um, the lack of consensus around what the best metrics really are to show what's successful. So there are certain things that have worked well, uh, like development of clinical pathways that clinicians can follow. Um, but in terms of the impact that those have on the outcomes associated with the stewardship programs, that's a little bit more sparse. And in area, two areas that are really starting to develop more now for antimicrobial stewardship on the human health side, which I think is also interesting in the animal health sector, is the application of implementation science and the application of behavioral sciences. So, so much of the um, decisions that are made regarding antibiotic prescription are really based on behavior and personal beliefs and attitudes and knowledge and that relationship between the clinician and the patient or the parent that's sitting there with their sick child. And implementation sciences gets at the question of even if we have that perfect intervention or that best practice that you're asking about, the success of that is heavily dependent on how well it's implemented in a given setting. And that can vary from hospital to hospital, hospital setting to community setting, long-term care setting. So there's a lot of different factors to consider that are still really being explored. I, I would like to know if we can have both pork chops and antibiotics. <laughs> Um, can we? Can you bring put up my presentation again? Perhaps the deeper question is: Can we have our pets and antibiotics too? <laughs> <laughs> so, looking at this whole issue from a One Health perspective, humans, animals, and the environment. Um, okay, great. Uh, let me just ra rock it forward and get to that slide. Okay, so can we have our pork chops and antibiotics too? Well, what's really making this whole um, issue very interesting is some of the advances in science and technology and our understanding of the human microbiome and the environmental microbial ecosystem of the planet. And the Human Microbiome Project has shown that our bodies are basically entire ecosystems 
of, uh, of bacteria and other microbes, and they play an instrumental role in keeping us healthy. And the problem with antibiotic use is that, um, for the most part, they'll go after the, the uh, pathogenic microbes, the bacteria, but they'll also inadvertently um, harm or kill the beneficial bacteria as well. So we're using a shotgun approach or sloppy medicine, if you will. And there's a great book that I highly recommend by Dr. Martin Blazer at NYU called The Missing Microbe. And he's done a lot of research on increasing use of antibiotics and the rise of um, diseases like obesity and autoimmune diseases, asthma, um, food allergies. A lot of these he's attributing to widespread use of antibiotics. So one could argue that our, our reliance on antibiotics, absolutely no question, they've saved millions of lives. But at the same time, we've had high costs. And, well, of course, animals have microbiomes too. So whatever we're giving them can be um, targeting not only the, the harmful bacteria, but also the beneficial bacteria. Um, so uh, what's interesting is that in some of the food animal microbiome studies, that appears that some microbes appear to be positively correlated with growth and others are negatively correlated. And we really need to have more studies to understand these relationships. So the question then is, well, nobody's really figured out how these low-dose growth-promoting antibiotics actually work. Are they somehow targeting these microbes that are, negative, that are negatively correlated with growth to allow those that are positively correlated to proliferate? Or is there something more fundamental that they're um, just addressing low levels of inflammation that could be um, causing the animals to grow? Now, interestingly, there have been some studies on children who are starving in, in countries of Africa, like Malawi, and they found that if you give low-dose antibiotics to these children, their survival rate increases markedly, above and beyond just giving them food. So this, whatever happens in the food animals appears to be a process that can occur in our bodies as well. If you look at this from a One Health perspective, I kind of think of our use of antibiotics as kind of our use of fossil fuels. Yes, it's very easy to use. Yes, it's highly efficient. Um, but it's come with significant costs to the environment. In the case of fossil fuels, we've got uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the warming of the planet, which is threatening our civilization. Our widespread use of antibiotics, um, these antibiotics and residues and resistance genes are flooding into the environment. And what some of the environmental studies are finding is that antibiotic resistance genes appear to be ancient and they appear to be everywhere. Um, we don't know what goes on under the soil for the most part. Most of the microbes cannot be grown in the laboratory. And so what people have done is they've extracted DNA directly from the soil. These are called metagenomic studies, directly from the soil. They don't know exactly where the, this genetic material is coming from, but they can look at it nevertheless. And they've found resistance genes in the Arctic. They've found them in the Antarctic, in isolated caves. I mean, they're everywhere. Um, and what it appears to be happening is that We've always assumed that bacteria use um, minute amounts of these antibiotics as a form of chemical warfare against each other. But it appears actually that they use these chemicals as a form of communication. And so as we're blasting the environment with all of our antibiotic use, we appear to be changing the whole microbial ecosystem of the planet in ways that we really don't understand. Uh, and a lot of these resistance genes uh, resistant microbes are getting into wildlife, and they're spreading it far, particularly birds, they're spreading them far and wide, defecating. So it's, it's basically kind of a bad practice that we're doing. So from a, oh, what happened? 
Well, Dr. Cohen, we need to end it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll I'll just stop. I just want to just say that I think bacteriophages are very are nature's natural foe against bacteria, and we should make them work for us. That's all I'm saying. Excellent. Let's give them a round of applause.